this table to make changes. Uh, I think we've heard some common ground about the importance of outcomes-based and, and evidence-based and service-based budgeting, and that budgeting is not only about the numbers, but also, uh, importantly, about the values uh, of a city. And uh, also some really interesting discussion about different ways for the public to get engaged, whether it's on you know, uh, questioning some of the assumptions in a budget, uh, whether it's on looking for areas where the city can stop doing what it's doing as opposed to just doing more. Um, anyway, so I'd like to thank the, the panelists again for a great discussion. Okay, so the next item on the agenda and the last item for the morning program is the presentation of our uh, review of the uh, 2015 budget process, which we're calling uh, Bring the Public Back in Public Budgeting. And we really decided to do this to build on the consultation paper that we issued a couple of years ago which was really around setting a, a, a broad agenda for reforming the budget process. And so we thought, let's actually take a look at, because we know a lot of things are changing in the budget process, let's take a look at how the budget process works in a given year, really study that, and see where, how are we doing relative to some of the goals that we set out. So I want to invite up Andrew Doe, who's uh, one of our great team, uh, members of our team of volunteers, who's really led, done a great job in leading the process around preparing this uh, report. Uh, it was all done by a team of volunteers. Um, Andrew uh, has got a, a really interesting background. Uh, he was a fellow at the Institute for Municipal Finance and Governance, specializing in open government. Uh, he was a fellow at Studio Y at Mars. He's got experience at both the municipal and the provincial levels of government. And uh, you know, I think he's a certified uh, sort of budget and open government nerd uh, at this point. So I'm just going to invite Andrew up to present the, the results of our review.
to understand every effort should be sort of made to make them understandable for and to allow for an informed citizenry. It's one thing to have opportunities to participate, but if people don't understand and don't really have the knowledge base to really, they can't really effectively participate. So accessibility for us is a key enabler of that participation. So the question we ask is how accessible and understandable is the budget uh, to citizens? The third principle is vision. Uh, I mean, budgets to us are more than simply accounting exercises. They are a tool, as I sort of mentioned earlier, to sort of help realize the civic dreams we have to build a better city. And, uh, and they should be translated into long-term plans and goals. So it should be a way to support realizing these long-term plans and goals, and they ought to align with these uh, civic aspirations. So the question we ask ourselves is, well, how well does the budget process actually align with the city's longer-term goals, strategies, and plans that the city has in place? And the last is uh, an evidence base, because uh, we're all policy nerds. We probably talk a lot about evidence-based policy. And evidence matters as it ensures that we allocate our public resources into service and policies that actually work. And evidence and evaluation ought to be incorporated to ensure that we are actually making the right policy choices. Uh, so the question we ask is, is the budget actually informed by evidence? So to carry out this review, we did a number of things. And I'll sort of break it down to sort of three buckets of uh, categories. So we did a lot of first-person observations. And this entailed, you know, attending and playing anthropologist to three different deputations across the city, and actually attending six different town, town councillor-led town halls uh, that are meant to sort of engage citizens at a ward level. Uh, we also facilitated a, a workshop to sort of understand the user experience, meaning that we wanted to really understand citizens. Like, so what is it that, what's your objective with engaging with the budget? What are you doing when you're engaging with the budget? What are you actually thinking when you're doing that thing when you're engaging with the budget? How do you actually feel when you're doing that thing? So really trying to understand the human experience of like what it's like to go through the budget. And we actually collaborated with the Jane and Finch Community and Family Center and engaged 22 residents to try to understand it from their point of view. And obviously we recognize us as one segment of, of, of residents and there are many, many more. And this is something we want to actually build on. Um, uh, we also did a lot of uh, documents review, which is the second bu bucket of activities we did, which is, we went through their slide deck, we went through their background, we went through those analyst notes, infographics, the open data portal. We also did a media scan of, the 20, of how the media actually covered the 2015 budget process. Mind you, we only looked at print media, we didn't really get a chance to look at radio media and TV coverage, and we recognize those are important. So those are just sort of things I just want to be transparent about. And uh, the last sort of thing we did was we also did a jurisdictional scan for municipal budgeting practices from what other cities are doing. So kind of without further ado, I'm actually going to move on <laughs> to what we actually found. So in participation, what is it that we actually found? So how is Toronto actually doing in the, you know, for, for budget process and being participatory? So we found that there was actually a lot of opportunities for public engagement across different areas of the city, but we kind of think that the format of engagement, engagement could be more interactive. Uh, right now, the way it works is that staff go up, they present their 120 page, 120 page slide show, and then there will be a Q&A about that slide show, and, and we think that there are more opportunities to perhaps be more interactive uh, in that process as well. We also think that uh, citizens can engage a little earlier in the process, as sort of the panel mentioned, when citizens get engaged in the formal budget process, the big decisions have been made, and we think there are opportunities to engage a lot earlier. We also found that opportunities to engage online is relatively limited. Right now, the only online engagement looks like send, a, send your counselor or send the budget committee an email, and other cities will have online tools to actually engage uh, with, uh, with setting priorities on, online and submitting an online submission portals. And we think that the city can look into exploring these type of tools. We are also pretty excited by sort of two policy initiatives that the city are doing. I want to give full credit to, to the city for actually being bold in actually pursuing this. One is that they are launching participatory budget pilots in three wards across the city with $150,000 allocated to each ward. And we really hope that these pilots are successful so that momentum can be built to scale these uh, pilots up. Uh, participatory budgeting, if you don't know, and there's a workshop on it, is uh, the idea that uh, residents at a local level can kind of vote for are given a pot of money and can vote on the projects they like to see in their neighborhood and the community. And so we think this is a wonderful opportunity uh, for
for citizens to actually get engaged in the budget. Um, and also, we'd like to also give a, a shout out to Councillor Mike Layton, who uh, put forward a motion that city staff must report back into looking into a comprehensive, a comprehensive community consultation process for future budget processes, which for us provides a unique window of opportunity to rethink the way uh, we do uh, budget compensations. And so that, that's very exciting for us. Uh, and so a report could be expected sometime in, uh, I believe, late fall 2015. Well, the city staff here can probably correct me if I'm wrong, but that's the timeline we we're looking at. So that's something for us here in this room can actually get involved in that process of doing what we're thinking. So what are other actual cities doing in terms of uh, encouraging participation in the budget process? So New York City is one city that does that. Uh, one, New York City has, uh, has just recently launched a scaling up participatory budgeting uh, across the city. So 25 councillors have agreed to sort of do this in, in their respective uh, wards. $25 million each, 25 councillors. That's a million dollars per ward that citizens can actually engage in. So that's a significant sum of money that citizens can actually help realize like certain uh, projects they want in the community. So that's pretty exciting. So there is precedence there. Um, New York City also has a pretty comprehensive budget consultation process that extends pretty much throughout the entire year. So this is something that's taken from their independent budget office, which is kind of like a roadmap of like all the opportunities and all the touch points that citizens can actually engage in. There's multiple, so it's 10 months long, like you can, citizens can start engaging in September, and July is when the final vote for the budget is. That's 10 months, that's eight months longer than this and we do at the City of Toronto from when we publicly launch the budget, at least in a formal way, to the final vote. And that's 10 months of formal engagement. I'm not talking about what informal engagement as well. City of Calgary does have, is a good example of looking into very different tools to engage. So they have a lot of in-person consultations, workshops, town halls as well, but they also have a lot of ways to engage online as well to build an action plan. And part of building that action plan is actually setting priorities on like on the budget to actually realize the, the goals set out in that. So that's where the city is at and what other cities are doing with respect to participation. Our second principle, how are we doing along the principle of accessibility? So on that front, we sort of found that the city is actually making a genuine effort and we'd like to actually give full credit to the to city staff to really improving the budget related sort of projects. So products, so slideshows to infographics. In fact, every city department we sort of noticed had as, a, as an infographic attached to it. So, so we'd like to, get, and they also provide a toolkit as well for our citizens to engage. That being said, we do think there are opportunities to sort of consolidate all that information uh, with all those analyst notes that were, that, were, that were referenced. Each one's about 70 pages. There are about I don't know the exact number of apartments, boards, no, no, what is it? agencies, boards, commissions, and divisions. There are, but let's just say, for the sake of argument, let's just say there are 60. And each department has operating analyst note and a capital N, capital analyst note. Each one is about 70 pages long. You're looking at a lot of analyst notes to go through to really understand what that city department actually does and what they're budget. So that is a lot of information to go through. And we just think there are ways to actually just put that all in like one for all. And not to mention you have to go through like 80 different websites kind of thing in, on the budget portal to actually access all these analyst notes. So it's, it's quite a hassle if you're really interested in really understanding what the city actually does. Uh, we think there are opportunities to improve open data. We don't really see too many data sets with respect to the budget, but we know that that will be changing. Isn't that right, Keith? <laughs> And, uh, but that being said, I mean, just the way we uh, sort of report back on our open data, uh, we think there are a lot of opportunities to improvement, like providing a glossary of clean terms, like what is an interdivisional recovery? I don't really quite know, but if you're to download the open data set, there's a lot of stuff on like an interdivisional recovery, and I don't really know what that means, and there's not a key, there's not a glossary of key terms to provide on what that actually means, but it's a significant sum of money uh, for an apartment. And making the formatting a little more consistent as well, just to make it for more easy for end users to, re to really make, to translate that raw data into some in actionable insights. There's also an opportunity to engage and build the capacity of sort of community-based groups to mobilize residents around budget literacy and engagement. So kind of what we found with residents when we sort of spoke with them, mind you, a very specific segment of residents, is that they tended to trust sort of more community-based 
organizations and their service providers, action for neighborhood changes, more than the city does, even though the action for neighborhood change is sort of a, a sort of a city kind of run type, type of organization. And uh, that there's a real opportunity there to actually work with them in doing this. So the city doesn't have to do all of the work, essentially, what we're trying to say is that there is an offer that you can work with other kind of stakeholders to engage, uh, to engage there. So what are other cities doing in terms of accessibility? So Philadelphia, for example, uh, has a great budget data visualization. Uh, so it makes it really easy and understandable to digest what, what each city service is doing and like where the money is actually going. Uh, Mississauga is doing better than us when it comes to budget allocation. I know that as Torontonians, it hurts to think that Mississauga is doing better than us in something. <laughs> <laughs> but one of the things they do well in is actually a budget allocator tool. So you actually understand like, so they, so like you actually understand like, well, it's a priority setting tool, but it also, it serves as an educational tool as well that in, to increase services here that you may need to that it may have implications for, for, for raising taxes or, or whatnot, what taxes can't be used as well. So uh, we as city, we don't have the opportunity for an income tax, and, and residents can understand that there. But at the same time, it might be the case that what, if you increase money here, you might need to increase money elsewhere. Uh, obviously, there could be two problems with the way you set up a budget allocator tool, but that's something that Mississauga is doing. And one thing the city of Chicago is doing, they actually present all their budget, budget information in like kind of like one document. Uh, and it's really easy to read using plain language. They actually won a Distinguished Budget Presentation Award, which to us was the most shocking thing, that there's actually an award for the most distinguished budget presentation. <laughs> uh, so in terms of vision, how are we as a city doing? So kind of what we found is that we think, we see that Toronto has a lot of long-term plans and, and a lot of strategic visions for the future and where we as a city want to go in a few years from now, but we can maybe do a better job in periodically sort of updating uh, these long-term plans and visions and maybe consider doing some long-term visioning exercises. I mean, we understand that the official plan is undergoing a bit of a review and being updated, but something like the strategic actions, which is something that the city manager talks a lot about it's from 2013 to 2018, just looking about like, how we're doing along those fronts and can reconsider doing them. But that's something that we think uh, can be looked into. Uh, also linking the budget to these uh, city plans. Um, so, so the strategic actions, which is one long-term plan we sort of mentioned. If you go through the budget presentations, they'll actually talk about how, about like the like, higher level kind of strategic actions the city's doing, but the link between like what the, what, the link between like the budget and, and, and realizing the strategic actions isn't always really, really made clear. Uh, and it makes it very difficult to understand like what the story of that budget is supposed to be. So for an example, if you go through the slideshow, they'll mention a lot of poverty reduction. That's a key priority for us. And yet we only allocate, and they say it's really, really important for us. We're allocating a lot of resources. So we're allocating $19 million, which, in, which is a drop in the budget con considering that the entire budget is 11.5 billion. But if you were to read just how the city, the story of the city is trying to sell, the numbers and the budgets don't quite line up to, to the story. So just doing better linking, linking those a little better would make it easier. Linking it with the long-term fiscal plan as well, which is a plan that the city has had since 2005. So things, there's opportunities there. Uh, we find the move to service-based budgeting. So the panel was mentioning stuff about service standards. So that's encouraging. And the way that works is set the amount of services you want and then build a budget around that rather than here's a pot of money, then we build services. So that's encouraging. That uh, that kind of exercise uh, better allows for integrated planning to, to actually support uh, long-term vision. And then the last thing we sort of found uh, encouraging is multi-year operating budget. So obviously our capital budget, you saw that they, they do projections into 10 years. So we've been always been doing that, but now we're looking into moving that. You're also looking into that on the operating side as well. We just think that there's more work to be done there. Some departments do financial projections and others, we don't really see evidence that they're actually doing that. So, so we think there's a little bit more work to be done there. So what are some cities doing with respect to vision? So Calgary is doing something. Uh, the mayor actually briefly mentioned the uh, action plan and the Imagine Calgary initiative, which is looking 100 years into the future, what the city of Calgary will look like and how are we actually gonna get there 100 years from now. Uh, so that's 
that's something that Calgary does, and they involve citizens into that long-term visioning exercise. Uh, the city of Helsinki, or however you pronounce Helsinki in Finnish, which I'm not going to attempt to pronounce there, um, sort of mandates that the city's strategic plan gets updated after every election to identify major object objectives and to establish budgetary goals on an annual basis to realizing those strategic objectives. So that's something Helsinki does, and that's uh, and our, our kind of last principle is kind of our evidence base. How well is the city actually using evidence to inform their budgetary decisions? Uh, well, one, we see that the city is using some sort of cost ban benefit and value for money tools to allocate budget dollars. Uh, so the city has run a lot of service efficiency reviews a few years ago. We may have we may have remembered the core services review as well. Um, so those are and obviously very very controversial uh, for those that were involved in mobilizing. Around that, but those were examples of trying to look at like, well, what what are exactly the services we need? Uh, but those haven't been done since 2011. So looking into, and we know what the city is doing that, but just uh, looking about where it might be appropriate and provide evidence that they are actually using these tools. It's not very clear like how they are arriving at these decisions all the time. Um, we also see that the city has a very robust performance management system in place and benchmarking systems in place, like our participating in the Ontario Municipal Benchmarking Initiative, and there's a new international standards organization, so, um, kind of performance measurement thing, ISO 37120, which, I, which I'm not gonna go through what the entire name of that means, but like the city is actually look, like very, very serious about doing performance measurement, but it's not really clear how these performance metrics are actually being used to inform budgetary decisions, and we think that there's an opportunity uh, there to making that link more explicit. And uh, we also see that the city is investing in a tool called FPARS, which is meant to support the service-based uh, budgeting approach I was talking to earlier. And uh, we sort of agree with kind of the goal that FPARS seeks out to do, uh, but we at Better Budget Geo would, would really like to see the fruits of this investment and for it to be shared with the public, so, so we understand that it's taken some time to fully implement it, and we kind of look forward to uh, seeing what FPARS can, can look like. And uh, just making the uh, available data more relevant to public and decision makers, data in and of itself does not necessarily need evidence. Uh, you have to actually make that link itself. And so how can we actually make that data and translate that data into like something usable that we can actually make decisions on? Uh, it's not always cool. Like there is a, a lot of data there. It's just not very clear like what that data can be used for and how it can inform decision making. So just telling a better story about what, what that data how it's being used. And so what are other cities doing uh, to, with respect to uh, evidence or without, with respect to informing their policies on using evidence? So New York City is another one. They had a Center for Economic Opportunity. This is uh, a policy shop that really that tests uh, programs that are, both, that are meant to enhance social mobility. And uh, they do a lot of randomized controlled trials and they determine which, which program actually maximize its impact and then they fund those. And it was pretty innovative that Harvard actually gave them an award in in, in innovation in government. Baltimore is, is another example of a city doing it. So they have a program called City Staff, which is a very robust performance measurement system. Uh, since it was implemented in about 2000, 2001, it was able to realize nearly million dollars of savings by just reallocating the resources that were already there to determine which programs actually maximized impact and it too also won an award from Harvard for innovation in government. And kind of the last uh, thing, uh, kind of the last kind of organization there, which is Bloomberg Philanthropies, which isn't necessarily cities per se, but it's a you know it's a nonprofit run by Michael Bloomberg, the former mayor of New York, where he's investing 42 million across 100 mid-sized US cities to sort of encourage more evidence-based policy making. So the appetite is there, and the, the appetite is there for more evidence-based policy making, and, and that there are organizations supporting it. So kind of what is the sort of overall conclusion we come? We see that Toronto is actually making a lot of progress against all these four principles. That being said, we recognize that there is still a lot of work to do to be a world leader, to be that place that other cities actually look to for leadership on budgeting issues. And we think we can actually get there and we hope that this report and the conversation we'll have this afternoon will be a good first step to actually getting to the city we want, which is to be the
decision known for the best budgeting practices in the world. So thank you very, very much.